What's going on team? Welcome back along to the channel where today we continue the hype into the 2019 Super Rugby season. Today we will be having a look at the South African Conference, the five sides coming out of Africa and Argentina. We're having a look at these sides of so the ins, the outs, the keys and what we think is going to happen with them in 2019. But of course... It can't be done alone, so we're bringing back the guests again for Super Rugby and introducing those new to the channel and those who've been around for a while. Welcome back to Brett Hartley. Yeah, thanks for having me back on Corn Flag. It's been quite a while and looking forward to Super Rugby 2019. It is. It's the kickstart of the season. We're back into it, ready for another long World Cup year as well. That's something we've got to think about too, is the Rugby World Cup this year. Um, and Super Rugby, I uh, like the Six Nations, that's where it all begins um, for the Southern Hemisphere. Before we kick into it though, it's time It's time to plug the uh, good old yellow cap, which is, is going on the head. It is it's that time of the year again to get into Super Brew. Super Brew uh, picks are open once again for predictions on um, with the channel. So if you are wanting to have your say, you think you're the best picker out there, you can challenge me for this, although you're not going to get it because it took a lot of hard work to get this one here, even though it doesn't fit on my headphones quite right. But you can have yourself mentioned. Excel us from the week every time we do the preview, which hopefully we'll have Brett back on in the coming weeks for as well. Um, to have a look at the, the excelling people on the Super Brew Picks. So uh, details will be on screen. You can go check those out. Um, go join up and be a part of this season's Super Rugby Super Brew. But we're going to throw that away for now because it is all about preview time. And um, before we have a look at the teams, Brett, I've got one big question for you, an important question as well. Superhero kits. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about this? Um, yeah, look, when it, when it was first announced, I thought it was a bit gimmicky. Uh, I know they announced it sometime last year. And the public weren't too sure about the type of product that was going to be produced and why they were really doing it. But, um, you know, the kits have come out. Some of the connections, you know, the Storm is a Thor, which sort of makes sense. The Sharks are Black Panther, which kind of... Um, Lion Spider-Man, yeah, maybe. Bulls Captain America, absolutely not. Um, you know, I, I made a joke um, to one of my mates the other day saying the most Afrikaans team in the whole competition is wearing a Captain America jersey. So um, <laughs> I found that quite ironic, but um, they've sort of grown on me. Um, a lot of them are really quite good-looking kits. Um, and obviously they had the whole big preseason double header superhero um, Sunday, I uh, think they are calling it, um, in Cape Town, Cape Town Stadium uh, this last weekend. Um, and that was, I, I would say, a fairly good success. They had a sold-out stadium or close to sold-out stadium, and they had two really good double headers. Um, with fairly full-string teams. And, um, you know, if it sells jerseys, obviously coincides with that Last Avengers movie coming out sometime this year. I'm not quite sure when it is, but sort of cashing off of that hype. And, um, you know, if it sells jerseys, makes the teams money that they can reinvest into their teams, then, um, you know, good on them. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, one, one of the things I don't like about it is they're wearing, apparently every, every single South African derby, they're wearing those jerseys and might get a bit old. Um, oh. especially when there's so many derbies in the competition. So um, if it was, you know, two, two or three rounds, it would be fine maybe, but might get a bit old after a while. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, that's going to be interesting, isn't it, if they wear them that much as well. But uh, yeah. it's, if it's good, if it gets people into it, uh, gets, you know, sells the jerseys, makes the club money, gets a bit more, a uh, few people through the gates, hey, then it's all good. That's uh, that double header match was quite a good success too. So um, yeah. hopefully, saying they might see more of in future. But it's, it's, I mean, it was a good idea and it worked pretty well for yeah. them as well. Uh, right, let's get into the sides. Let's have a look at the first team. We'll start alphabetically, starting off with uh, your favourite side to, <laughs> uh, to give a bit of a rub to the Bulls. Um, now the Bulls going to be the John Mitchell list this season. I think I think it's yeah. probably going to. I don't know. What do you think about that, how that went last season? Do you think there was a success? I mean, most people, a lot of Bulls fans especially, raged about how great John Mitchell was. Now the season's done. What do you, yeah. What's the, the, the post-mortem report on how John Mitchell went with the Bulls? Yeah, look, when, when I sat in this chair last year and was talking to you previewing the Bulls uh, for Super Rugby 2018, I absolutely laid into John Mitchell and I thought he was a terrible appointment. Uh, <laughs> Results-wise... Uh, you could look at it as a failure um, in, in terms of getting results, but I think the overall success was that he got the Bulls playing a type of rugby that they've never played before in their history, um, and 
a uh, type of rugby that really suited a lot of their players. You got your guys like Andre Pollard, Jesse Creel, who really, really benefit off running the ball. And the Bulls, yeah, like I said, didn't have that many great results, but especially when they came into New Zealand and they competed really, really well at the Kiwi sides. I don't think they landed up picking up a win in New Zealand, but um, they definitely stayed in, stayed in the contest for the full 80 minutes and played some really good rugby and had some really, really good tries. And um, you're saying the Bulls had some really good highlights last year. It's something that you don't normally hear too much, but um, obviously I'm not the biggest fan of the Bulls, but I enjoyed watching a lot of their rugby last year. And I think John Mitchell did um, take them into the right direction and his absence uh, might be a bit of a mistake. It's interesting you speak about how well they uh, they they scored their tries and, and the, the type of rugby they played. A big standout for whether it was John Mitchell's influence or not uh, was the impact players like uh, Lud Diego and that had running the ball, not yeah. floating and keeping it alive uh, for yeah. the other players around him as well. Which that that style of rugby was um, uh, it was a fresh breath air, a fresh breath of air for Bulls fans and rugby fans to, to yeah. see that from them as well. But now I guess he's off claiming victory for England now, isn't he? So he's saying yeah. he was a catalyst for that English victory <laughs> over Ireland. But whatever, John. I mean, you've always lived in a cloud, so just <laughs> yeah, keep on with it. So the Bulls have had a lot of ins and outs this season. Uh, they lost a lot of key players. Adrian Strauss, for one, and in the front row is definitely going to be one they missed. But what have you made of the players you've brought in and out this year? Um, I think they, they have lost... The only really two key players I've lost, I think, are Strauss, obviously, their retirement. Uh, always been a good leader, always been a really good carry of the ball, uh, a good hooker. And they've also, surprisingly, when they released Jumbo Alango, I was really, really surprised. Um, I thought he had a lot of potential, big big wing of the ball, similar to what sort of the archetype a lot of New Zealand teams use, that big uh, winger. But, uh, yeah, they, they released him not not completely sure where he is right now. If he's picked up a contract with another super rugby team from what I've seen, I don't think he has. Um, I thought he had a lot of potential, had a bit of a quiet year last year, but obviously they weren't too happy with him. And with the, um, the call they brought in, obviously that he, they thought he wouldn't fit in. Um, in terms of the players they brought in, I've been pretty impressed with them, uh, this off season in terms of, um, the sort of free agent signings. They've probably been the premier, um, destination this year um, in, in the off season. Obviously, Dwayne Vermeulen, their their biggest signing, uh, one of the biggest, one of the best number eights in the world, um, in my opinion. I think a lot of people's opinions too. Um, awesome player, especially around the ruck. Um, and, you know, they got the likes of Skulk Brits as well, sort of that Dan Coles type player, that um, sort of new millennium type hooker, uh, who's quite who's quite nippy, quite pacey, and can run the ball really well. Um, Bit of a gamble bringing in Cornell Hendricks. I think the preseason game two weeks ago was his first professional game in three years, I think. So 2015 was his last professional game before that preseason game uh, this year. So three or four years. But uh, he's been inactive for quite a while. Um, good to see him back. His defense was always very questionable, even when he was at the peak of his career playing for the Springboks. Uh, whether this is his revival year, and I, get, I think he's going to want to make a stamp to possibly get into that World Cup squad. Um, but he'll have to, a lot of improvement to do, with, especially with the young wingers around mm. South Africa right now. Um, and a lot of uh, another good thing they've done is they've um, they bought in quite a big core of sevens players um, in their back line. So they got um, guys like Dylan Sage, who I'm quite familiar with because um, he played for the Western Force uh, a couple of years ago in, in the development squad. Really good sevens player for the um, Blitzbocker. They got Stedman Khans, who's a pretty decent sevens player as well, quite nippy. Uh, Carl Dupria, who's um, played a fair few games in the Blitz box. Uh, he's looked pretty good in those games. And the big one being Roscoe Speckman, probably my favorite sevens player. Um, really nippy, um, intelligent uh, player, good playmaker. Whether he can translate into 15s, you see guys like Sinatla, who have really struggled in the 15s format of the game. But you have guys like Corga Smith, who have thrived. Um, so it depends what side of the ball he, he drops on. But... Um, Good, good pick out those sevens players. A bit unfortunate for the Blitzbox who are struggling right now with uh, <laughs> these type of guys. But um, yeah, in terms of their free agency, I think I think they've done quite well. Yeah, it's uh, often a 50-50, isn't it? So what well, those sevens players turn out to be. A lot of them, I find this, especially when you play, say, guys like Sinatla who have come through, don't get the game time they probably really mm. need. But it, it's a risk, isn't it, to get those guys to come into the next into that form and, and try and translate to a field where they've got 
nowhere near as much room as they're used to on a sevens field as well. So interesting that they've gone with that sort of much, but definitely gives them a lot of explosive talent. Um, I think they've, they've recruited really well, especially, you know, like you spoke about Arjun Strauss, your biggest loss. Uh, to get a guy like Shock Brits uh, in from yes. Saracens, I think is a really good coup because they need a guy that, that's a huge hole to fill. And they've needed someone that definitely does pull it in. And uh, like you say, Don Vermeulen, huge, big one. Surprised didn't go back to the Stormers, though, because that's really, you know, that, that was his super rugby side, wasn't it, um, mm. in the past? But he's not gone back there. Um, I think Yep. <coughs> I think um, he he said in an interview that he actually went to go back to the Stormers ask, oh. and asked them if he could get a contract, and they turned him down and said they want to focus on youth, um, which is quite a surprising move by them. But, yeah, mm. that's, why, that's why he's at land up at the Bulls. That's really surprising. I'm just going going completely off topic here, but you look at who they've got in the back row. They've just lost guys like Nizam Carr. Um, they've mm. not picked up anyone like, say, youth. So, yeah, that's a bit, yeah. a bit surprising, actually, that they haven't gone with that, a bit of a leader to having that pack um, for the yeah. Stormers. But, hey, that, that's a big win for the Bulls to get a guy like him back into their team. Um, finally, we'll, we'll go with it because it's the first team. It's the first thing. But John Mitchell gone. We spoke about it already. New coach. We're gonna ha- we're gonna absolutely butcher his name, <laughs> but Pot Human, we're gonna go with that's that, that's my yep. terrible Kiwi way of saying a, a it's good South African name. Um, from the Blue Bulls, yeah, we can see the Curry Cup Bulls coming off a three win three loss, middle of the table, um, finishing in the top obviously fourth fourth spot. Um, do you think this is a case of best man for the job, or was it just getting that next tier guy coming up from Curry Cup? Doing the latter, you know, next job. Yeah. This is there's a progression that the Bulls want to go with from their Curry Cup side. Yeah, well, b- before I get into it, um, I haven't, I wasn't able to watch a lot of the Curry Cup last year. Obviously, um, immigrating from South Africa to Australia, Fox Sports here only show select few Curry Cup games, and very few of those games are actually Bulls games. Um, so they you pretty much only get the semi final, final, and then select few matches here and there, and, and most of them aren't live. So um, I f- it's a bit hard to judge um, Haman's form uh, as a coach in the Curry Cup considering I actually haven't seen that much so I'll give him a bit of benefit of the doubt considering uh, um, I haven't been able to probably form my opinion on him but um, look, looking at him just as, around his appointment uh, I think Victor Madfield is actually the first choice for the job and I think he uh, if my memory serves me right I think he turned it down so uh, Haman was their second man um, for the job and um, whether it will be a good um, good appointment, I'm not sure. Uh, from what I've heard about him and, and from the few highlights I've seen, they might be going in reverse direction to what they were with John Mitchell, which can be quite worrying, especially with a guy like Andre Pollard around. They might be going back to their more traditional uh, type of kicking the ball um, territory game, uh, that, that's traditional Bulls rugby. But um, hopefully he'll prove me wrong and hopefully he'll come up with some clever things this season. Obviously, I'm not the biggest Bulls fan, but... Um, in terms of SA Rugby in the World Cup coming up, you want um, you want all your Super Rugby sides to perform and you want them to develop good players so that the Springboks can thrive. And, and throughout history, the Springboks have been good when the Blue Bulls have been good. So um, it'll be good if, if he can come up with something new. It doesn't have to be completely blitz running rugby, but um, it, it's it, he's got to get results. And uh, I think if he doesn't, he might be out of a job fairly quickly. So I think he'll be under quite a lot of pressure this season. So we'll see how he, how he performs. You look at this season, the Curry Cup, were, I mean, three and three, not the greatest, not mm. the worst, but it, it took two extra time to be beaten in the semi-final against Western Province. Um, yep. So, you know, and Western Province only lost that final by five points. So they're there or thereabouts. So within a shout of probably getting into a good sh- chance of actually taking the competition out in the end um, for the old Bulls. But uh, that's a quick look at this side. Uh, final thoughts on them. Where do you think they're going to come in South Africa this season? They're going to be a, a challenging for those uh, playoff spots? Yeah, I think the South African Conference this year, I think you have a you have a top two that are pretty set in stone at this point. And then you have the bottom three who I've sort of given them a ranking, but um, they the bottom three can easily chop and change throughout the season and it could be look out it could be look extreme it could look extremely different to what I've said they would be. So um, right now I've got the Bulls finishing last in the conference just in terms of their new coach. Um, they've got 
Ludiaga, obviously named as a new captain. Not sure how he'll go in his leadership, but with guys like having with guys like Dwayne Vermeule in there will help him a lot with that. Um, so it it depends. At this point, I got them finishing fifth. I don't think they are quite at the level of the Stormers and Jaguars yet, but they could easily prove me wrong, um, and they could finish third um, or fourth. Uh, it it depends sort of how the ball drops for them. But yeah, th- at this point, I got them finishing last in the conference. Yeah, it's going to de- depend on how they adapt, how they get into the new squad, new new building, um, new leaderships, everything like that. It's going to take time to adapt for the Bulls. But I mean, last time, we bagged them out, and they come out and they thrash. I'm pretty sure it was the Hurricanes. Wasn't it the first game of the season? And everyone yeah. thought the Bulls were the greatest team in the world. Um, <laughs> they come quickly tumbling down. We'll move on, though, on to uh, the Lions. Now, the Lions are an interesting side. Um, a few players lost uh, in the offseason, and very yeah. few have come back in. Uh, you see this is slightly weakening of the Lions or are they just as strong as ever? I think they are slightly weakening. Um, I think this is a, a, a do or die year for the Lions. Uh, made the last three finals um, and obviously are zero for three. And then, and with the talent they've lost, um, they in terms of pure talent, I think they've lost the most out of any Super Rugby team. And the likes of Franco Moss, Jakob Creel, Ron, Jansen van Rensburg, uh, very, very big names and, and names that the Lions have brought up over the last few years and have, have absolutely shined. Um, a lot, a lot, obviously, Jakob Creel, Ron, Jansen van Rensburg, injuries have, have held them back a little bit, but um, definitely star players of world rugby and um, they'll definitely be missed at the Lions. Yeah, three finals. That's what I was going to bring up next. Um, something mentally, I mean... In the final, these guys surely must be completely lost. But getting mm. to that stage, three years in a row, and the core of that squad, with not many new players coming in, they must know the way there. They must know how to do it and what they've got to do. And like again, with the core of the squad, you've still got a lot of guys who lead the team. And they'll be the ones to do it again. Do you think just based on instinct of what these guys know, more than actually out-and-out talent of players is going to get the Lions to another good position or finish this year? Yeah, I think so. But also with that experience comes bad, bad memories, um, you know, bad thoughts associated with, with playing in finals. Um, it's sort of just natural. Um, unfortunately, in, in the finals, they've developed a bit of tra- of, of, of choking a bit in the finals. Um, and maybe they've got a bit of a mental block right now. Um, I can't even imagine what it's like to get to the finals three years in a row and, and not win one of them, especially... Um, two years ago when they hosted the final Ellis Park and lost to the Crusaders um, after that red card to Quagga Smith very early. Um, and, and since then, they looked good last season. Didn't look as dominant as they normally do. Um, pulled through to the final. Um, obviously didn't do well enough to climb that, that top spot on the log for the Crusaders. So over to Christchurch, they went and um, landed up losing that final. Um so I think that the experience is definitely on their sides, but whether they can get over that mental hurdle, um, especially with teams like the Crusaders hanging around, um, it's going to be very tough for them. Yeah, the same coach of the side again um, this season. It's definitely going to help them. Um, but the key guys, who, who do you think is going to be a standout to lead this side if they're going to actually be another success and go maybe a fourth final mm-hmm. in a row? Look, I think it, it comes down to basically five key players. you got Warren Whiteley, um, Captain Courageous. Uh, his health is definitely going to be a deciding factor to how this team does. Obviously missed a lot of time last year. So Warren Whiteley, um, big key for that team. Um, you obviously have guys like um, Quagga Smith, bit of a cult hero on this channel. Um, <laughs> awesome player. Um, really, I mentioned before, one of the Few players who actually who thrive um, outside of sevens comes to fifteens. Um, I've absolute asset for them. Um, a peer with Deanti, can't really say much more. But this man, um, pretty much one of the stars of world rugby right now, um, has that sort of aura of, that the young Brian Nevana did uh, with his finishing power, um, just his pure pace, his pure skill. Um, amazing player, and obviously Malcolm Marks, um, one of the best players in world rugby. Um, if not the best, definitely the best hook in my opinion. Um, to run the ball over the breakdown, his defence, he's just an immense player. Um, I think Malcolm Marks will be the main key player, but that, that um, and also uh, I didn't mention Elsie El- Yankees as well. His play, um, I haven't been the big fan of him, biggest fan of him over the last few years, especially in big games. I think he has a pretty big choking tendency, whether he, um, he changes that or not. 
awesome player for the most of the season, but when he gets to those tight situations in the playoffs, he tends to shy away a little bit. So those five key guys, that contingent, uh, who have been with the Lions for the last couple of seasons, um, definitely key to their success this year. So the Lions, another good season for them. Do you think where they're going to end up? Um, uh, yeah, in terms of what they've lost, um, might be a bit of a back step for them. Um, they've they signed Stefan Levis from the Sharks, who's a fairly decent lock. Whether he replaced Franco Mostert uh, will soon to be seen. I think Mostert's a massive loss for them, especially in their lineup calling and whatnot. Um, I've got them finishing second at this point, um, but I think with the with the team I've got finishing top, uh, it could be a shuffle, just like the bottom three. I think the top two will keep shuffling uh, throughout the season. So uh, I've got them finishing second right now, but easily could surprise um, surprise me and, and finish top spot. Interesting, interesting indeed. I thought I thought they would have been your top team once again, but uh, there we go. You've got a, a twist, a twist in the <laughs> table. All right, let's move on to your side, the Sharks, um, and again. It's something I've found a bit of a trend with, with South African teams this season, looking through who they've added or or not added or got rid of. Uh, a lot of outs and not too many ins and, and a lot of youth definitely coming yeah. through the sides as well. But the Sharks um, only pulling in one player this season, adding to their yeah. squad, losing a few. Um, have they got a big enough core already there to, to build on that and only, you know, only add the one player? I think they do. Um, obviously, the the biggest players they lost, uh, Stefan Levis, obviously to the Lions, uh, been a good luck for 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 us the last few seasons. Uh, Keegan Daniel, prob- uh, in my opinion, one of the most underrated players um, in South African rugby history, should have definitely played for the Springboks a lot more than he did. Former Sharks captain, uh, he obviously announced his retirement. Um, even if he didn't play much last season, he was always that constant leader around the squad. So uh, I do think he he was a fairly big loss and. Um, Michael Carson's a bit inconsistent, but a very good scrum half. And obviously Garth April, who has sort of been the epitome of inconsistency the last few years. Um, so on the whole, not too much loss. I think Levis is definitely our biggest loss um, in terms of performance. Uh, but saying that um, they've kept a lot of their, their main players and they kept that really good call that they had last year. I think last year was was the transition year um, for the Sharks team, and the fact that they've keep they've kept pretty much all of them together as as one consistent core, I think will definitely benefit them uh, more. If they had gone out and, and signed a bunch of players, changed up the culture, got, got all these new guys in there, these new pieces that needed fitted, uh, it might have um, worked in a negative effect for them. So I think keeping their core. Keeping pretty much the same guys. Obviously, just signing um, Ryan Van Heerden from the Bulls. Uh, just a replacement in there for um, Stefan Levis. Uh, young lock, 21 years old. Um, haven't seen too much of him, but um, from what I hear, he sounds like a pretty pretty good uh, prospect. So um, I think keeping this core uh, of, of players that they had over the last few years is going to work well for them. So where, where does it go all click together here for the Sharks? What what are the guys they're going to be looking at to, to really key this team together to uh, make a decent shout of themselves this season. They, they've got, like, they've kind of thinned out, haven't they? They've, they've had a wide group of players. They've thinned yep. out the guys that they've kind of thought, you know, aren't quite doing them the right sort of justice here. And now, it seems like, like say, they've got it to a point where they've actually structured it how they want it to be. But key yep. guys, who are they, who's going to stand up for them this season and really put their hand up for the Sharks? I think the main key guys at this point are the three Dupria brothers. You know, obviously Jean Luc Dupria, Dan Dupria, and then Robert Dupria. Um, v- extremely key, especially Jean Luc Dupria and, and Robert Dupria. Um, Jean Luc is one of the better flankers I've seen. It's one of the, the the best prospects in SA rugby right now. And looking at a World Cup year, something a play that you really want coming up. Uh, injuries have held both him and his twin brother back over the last few years. Um, so you really want to see Dan Dupria, Jean Luc. Consistent rugby in the starting lineup. Um, you really want to see those guys thrive there um, and have a season without any injuries um, because they haven't been able to do that thus far in their careers. They've always had some little injuries, some little niggles holding them back. Obviously, Robert Dupriar, I think one of the, in my opinion, as, as a pure fly half, probably the best in SA rugby. I think Andre Pollard's got the nod right now, but Robert Dupriar, just uh, a tactician. Um, Really good with his kicking, really good with his playmaking. Very intelligent player. 
his goal kicking, definitely the best goal kicker in South Africa, pure goal kicker. Um, and he'll do he'll do really well. Um, obviously, guys like Spoon Corsi as well. Um, keep developing good young winger, and just the growth of Kerwin Bosch as well as a fullback. I think that's where he'll keep getting the nod this year. I think Robert Dupria has pretty much cemented his place as the Sharks fly half. So Kerwin Bosch pushed back to 15, played more 10 throughout most of his career. So last season, put him at 15, had really good moments, had really not so good moments. His his defense definitely as a fullback definitely is a lot of work. But he's got the pace, he's got the kicking skills, he's got the the pure attacking skills that you need to be an elite fullback. So I think you do that. And then another guy I'm really excited to um, to talk about is just just when you think South Africa produced enough really good wings, um, young wings. You got Lilon Zas, who has was immense in the Curry Cup, awesome, really quick player. Uh, I remember one of the Curry Cup games last year, the Sharks versus the Lions. Uh, Deontay got the ball and was sprinting down the field. And usually when Deontay gets away, he, he just sort of just accepts that there's no one to catch him. And Zas turned <laughs> heel and, and caught him pretty quickly. And I think gave Deontay the fright of his life. So um, I think Zas will be coming off the bench to start of the season. But I think towards um, towards the middle of the season, end of the season, I think Zas will be starting um, on one of the wings. Mm-hmm. It will probably be Zas and Corsi. The, the two wingers. So uh, really, really excited to watch watch him develop as a player. Interesting. Not like they don't have enough amazing, young, talented wingers going yeah. around South Africa <laughs> at the moment. Goodness me. It's, when Brian Habana kind of retired, they had that little lapse, didn't they, where it was like yeah. uh, Peterson and, uh, you know, just bits of players who weren't really those out-and-out finishing guys. They just kind of filled the gap the best of what it was about. Now there's this whole wave of amazing young talent coming out in the wing in South Africa. They're going to be uh, ones to watch for sure between these yeah. guys, what the Lions have got. So there's some amazing talent in this team, um, or in South Africa, for the Springboks. And, and what a year. What a year. These guys are going to be absolutely killing it later on the year in Japan. Um, the Sharks, not much else has really changed for them. Um, do you see them actually doing one better? I mean, you've, you've picked the Lions to go second. Don't yeah. see me picking the Sharks to go number one. <laughs> I have picked them to go number one. <laughs> um, I might be a bit of bias, uh, considering I'm a Sharks fan, but um, from from what I've read, a lot of the pundits are also picking a shark, the Sharks to top the table. Um, mm. And over the over the years, I think as a Sharks fan, every single year I've said this is our year. But um, I, while I don't think the Sharks will win Super Rugby this year, I think they definitely can top the South African Conference. Um, just the piece they have, the fact that they've kept this core together, uh, the chemistry will just keep building from last year. No, only one new face they have to accommodate into their culture. So I think that would definitely benefit them. And I think Robert Dupree is a superb coach. Um, so I've got them fishing first. Ooh, there we go. Heard it here first. Sharks are top the table. Let's <laughs> move on. Enough about the Sharks. Let's go on to the Stormers. And we talked about the Sharks. How there's not many players coming um, into the team. Let me look at the Stormers. And there is a lot of players coming in and out of the Stormers' mm. side. So with the Sharks, we talked about keeping that core, keeping that culture, keeping it all the same. Um, is this going to be a troubled year for the Stormers with all these changes going on? Uh, it might be. Um, obviously, they've lost a couple of key players. Um, and they brought in a lot, a, a lot of uh, really, really young guys. And when I looked at the list of their players, in, I only recognised one of the players' names. Otherwise, they've all been young guys that they brought, they, they brought in. Um, while they're not while they may not translate into instant success, it might be a really good move for the future. Um, mm. You always want these young guys coming in. Your teams always want to develop their own players. It's always much better um, for a team's identity if, if they can look at their players and say, yeah, we developed these guys as opposed to just buying them sort of that European rugby culture of just buying your star players. Southern Hemisphere teams tend to like to develop their, their good players, um, which is what most of the South African teams have done. And the Stormers, obviously, they've gotten rid of a lot of their old core players that have been around their team for a long time. So they want to uh, develop their, their own players. And, and that's what they've done. They've brought in a ton of young, talented prospects. Yeah, a lot of players moving all over the place. And Nizam Carr off to the Wasps. Duval Divinak is off to Treviso. Um, what else we got? Raymond Rule is Raymond off to Rule. France. Uh, heap few players off to Japan. Really shelling it out. And like you say, everyone is coming locally um, in this side as well. Robbie Fleck, coach. Um, do you think yeah. he's going to have a big impact with these young guys? Is he the right man to lead the side in this sort of rebuilding stage? 
I'm not the biggest fan of Robbie Fleck, and I, I don't think many people are at this stage. I think this is a make or break year for him. Uh, I think if he doesn't get at least some results, um, definitely if, he, if the Stormers do line up finishing bottom of the South African Conference, I think his job will be gone. Um, mm -hmm. I've always sort of seen him as that they had um, Eddie Jones for like a week and then he left for England. So Robbie Fleck's sort of that guy that they rushed in there and I thought he'll be gone after that season, but they have kept him around. Um, um, I can't really even tell you what his play style really is because it's, he seems to be mixing it up a lot. Um, and it, it has been confusing his teams. And the Stormers over the last few seasons have been probably one of the worst teams on tour. Um, had some absolutely disastrous tours, especially over the last three years. Um, so I think this is a make or break year for him. Um, but I think by the end of the season, I think we'll be seeing a new Stormers coach taking the helm. Yeah, I mean, this is the sort of thing he should have been doing probably last season. Is getting yep. all these young guys in and, and getting this, ha having that as a rebuilding year and now attacking it um, this year. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of faith. You're putting on a lot of under 21 players, um, players only playing in Curry Cup. It's, it's a big risk um, for the Stormers, but you've not got them finishing last because obviously you put the Bulls there. Um, yep. Stormers are going to be in that big jam with, with the Hagwires and, and with the Bulls, of course, at the bottom fighting you know, for well, challenging those top two. Uh, who have you got them third or fourth? Um, I've got them th uh, third at this stage. Oh, that's interesting. With the young squad, yeah. you've got them coming in third. So that, that leaves no surprises as to who is to fourth. And that will be yeah. the last ti last side that we are talking about today. Obviously, the Jaguars from Argentina. Um, I mean, this is almost a carbon copy of what we just spoke about with the Stormers, isn't it? They've lost quite a bit yeah. of experience, but I guess looking through who they've still got... That that core fifteen that they'll be playing with, even possibly shading half of the twenty three as well, is probably still at a good, definitely super rugby level, but at, at a good point yeah. still at international rugby as well, wouldn't you say? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I think with the squad they got, obviously last season was a breakout season for the Jags. Um, they were pretty unlucky not to make the playoffs, weren't they? So hmm. um, I think the, that that would have caused a lot of frustration, and they had a Really good winning streak last year. I can't remember. It was, I think it might have been over six games. Um, really good, um, really good winning streak for them. Obviously, they've probably got the biggest home ground advantage out of any of the Super Rugby teams. Have to do probably the most travel as well. So, um, but the home ground advantage of them teams do not like playing um, in Argentina, especially if your name is the Lions. So, um, <laughs> they, oh, the teams hate going over there. Um, and um, uh, the Jags lift their lips when they see teams roll into their their home stadium, so um, could ha could that be good, a good year for them? Like you said, a bit of a transition year with all the youth that came in. Mm. Recognise absolutely none of the big names that they brought in. Um, so a lot of youth. Um, got got guys like Juan Martin Hernandez and um, Nicolas Sanchez who have gone to mm. pretty big names uh, in their back line. Um, whether the new fly half, I'm going to butcher his name, but I think his name is Dominic, <laughs> Domingo Moetti, the new young fly half. I absolutely butchered that name, I know it, but um, whether he's got really big shoes to fill, um, so whether he'll um, he'll step up is, is a question. Um, they've still got guys like Buffelli and Augustine Creevy around there who are world-class players and, and will help them achieve uh, success in 2019, hopefully. Yeah, that was my next point of call. That was was the number 10 jumper. Where, where they're going to go? Losing Hernandez and Sanchez is huge. And when you look at who they got listed as their fly halves as well, Santiago Gonzalez Iglesias, not really a fly half. From my uh, watching, he's yeah. more of a centre than he plays his time at 10. So I wouldn't imagine he's going to... Maybe they will. Maybe that is their tactic because he will be their starter to take the number 10 jumper. But it's not really an out-and-out -out fly half sort of player no. um, that you'd expect to have there. And... Um, uh, even the other guy they've got there, Jacqueline Diaz uh, Bonilla, has played actually one game for Argentina, if I'm not mistaken, um, in my early research. Yeah, one match he's played for the Pumas as well. So, obviously, these young guys have got quite a bit of uh, trust, I guess, that they're going to do the right thing. Um, he's not young anyway. He's 29. So, yeah. here you go. Experience somewhere in the world. Um, he's been around a bit. Um, <laughs> not really. 135 games since 2010 uh, for one <laughs> club. So, there you go. He's a one, he's a he's a one club pony. How about that? And here he is on the big <laughs> stage now for the Hagwaras. Um, they've also had a change of coach though. Mario Ledesma is gone. Um, 
Do you think it's going to affect the way that the, the, the Hugwares play this season? I think it will. I think Ledesma had a pretty good season at the Jags. Um, I do rate him as one of the best, definitely one of the best forwards coaches in the world. Um, he really knows what he's doing with the forwards and, and the, everything around the scrum lineup. Um, very experienced guy for Argentina, um, and he was um, very good for the Jags, which is why he's he's gone up with a big job now in Argentina coaching the Pumas. So um, hopefully he will uh, thrive in that Pumas outfit. But um, the new coach, don't know much about him. Um, I'm not even going to try and pronounce his name. Um, <laughs> it, it depends what identity and what culture he lays down. Um, he can't let his culture slip um, with guys like um, Lavanini in there who have a history of being hotheads, very un- undisciplined. And uh, before last year, they were the most undisciplined team in the comp. So um, he needs to definitely set a standard. Um, they can't be giving away silly penalties every five minutes because guys get frustrated. So um, it depends what, what uh, culture he lays down um, and how well he clicks with that outfit. But um, I think Ledesma is a pretty big loss. But, uh, you know, this guy might be one of the next great coaches. You never know. I tell you what, Gonzalo Cusida has, has <laughs> done quite a bit of work. He's come from Biarritz, so he's been in France. Uh, before that, Stade Francais, Racing Mitchell, and he was also the assistant coach of France, the actual French international side, plus played all around the globe, mainly in France, though. He quite liked playing in France, you've got to say that. Even played for Toulon, uh, 20 appearances there. So he's, he's quite a well travel guy, and I imagine... In that part of the world, with a team like the Huguaros, he, he should, you'd imagine, with, with the playing record and coaching record he's got, should demand something from the players as in terms of respect as what he's managed to do already. So surely it's got to be a good thing for them. Um, a guy like that who's experienced and he's been around for a while and he's a fly half. So there we go. It makes sense. That's why they've gone with these new guys because they've got a former fly half and he's yep. going to teach these guys the ropes completely. He's going to nail it. Absolutely smash it. Um, so, have you got these guys to come on fourth? Do you think it's going to be a, a good season for them? They're going to carry on from last year, or are they going to go backwards a bit? Because these guys, the Hugwires and the Sunwolves, are really under, always under the spotlight. Are yeah. they going to break? Are they going to get away from that from the, with the Sunwolves? Uh, yeah, um, Sunwolves, probably not. Um, <laughs> I don't think the Sunwolves belong in this comp, but I definitely do think there is, there is definitely a place for the, the Hagwari's in this, in this comp, they, they proved last season that they can get really good results. And then they picked up a couple of games in New Zealand as well. So um, they're a quality team. Um, just consistency is their biggest enemy at this point. If they can nail that, um, the travel doesn't help them. If they can somehow nail this travel, um, stay well rested throughout the season, um, and that they could do good things, they might even finish top two. Um, it would be pretty good to see the, the Hagwari's in a playoff spot. So we'll see how that goes. But um, I think it definitely could be a good year for them. Um, and they obviously could go up um, further than I've got them. They could go to three, maybe even two, um, if they wanted to. So um, definitely could be in store for a good year. could be in store for a bad year. It all depends on the type of culture this new coach creates. But, um, yeah, it, it would be interesting to watch them this year. My big concern about this side is, like you talked about, all the travel and that they have to do is the team – having the depth. Last season, they had three guys, four guys, who could play in each position. They could do the job. Now they've lost yep. guys. You, you, scrum half, they're all right. They've still got Bricino, Cabelli, Landaho, they're all right. But your fly half's going to be a problem. Uh, you lose, mm. like, a Delafonte in the centres or a Moroni Orlando, those guys. But Fellies, you know, those key guys, you lose one or two of them, and then you, all of a sudden you've got a new fresh guy who's back on that 50-50 train. It's where he's going to be up to that level. That is where they may struggle. These guys have to go straight into internationals as well, either side. So they've got to keep them fresh throughout the year or else so Ledesma's going to be kicking down some doors because he's going to get a pile of tired players in September um, and in Japan. So it's, it's going to be interesting. They're either going to build some really good depth or they're going to struggle um, when the going gets tough on the road um, for the poor old Haguares. But that is it. That is our five sides are from South Africa. Um, of course, we will be also having the New Zealand and Australian conferences, which should be um, out and about for you guys to watch as well if you want to check out them. Um, of course, we're going to have guests for those guys as well. But um, for the South African conference, we are done. So what do you got? Let's recap. You've got the Sharks. Um, then you've got the Lions. The, uh, Lions that's right. Stormers. Yep. Uh, Jaguars, and then Jags finally and the 
uh, balls coming in last position. So there you go. Um, Brett, where can everyone send you abuse? So you got a Twitter handle? To... <laughs> <laughs> yep, I sure do. Um, I'll be happy to cop it. Uh, if you want to, uh, it's at Brett Hartley 390 um, so come join the band so that we have on there during the rugby season. It's been, been a bit quiet over the last few months, which it normally does over the, over the summer, but um, should be back in full swing by the time Super Rugby comes out. Hey, all that all that hate you copped last season about the Bulls, who was right? <laughs> who was right well, in the end? You were right. Bot- bottom of the conference, <laughs> I called it, but people, Bulls fans didn't want to accept it. But, um, you know, I might cop more this year. I don't think I've been too, un- I, I don't think I've been too unfair on anyone, so... We'll see. Time will tell uh, when I read these comments. No, very good. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. As always, thank you to Brett for coming on and having your say. I will see you all for the other conferences as well. Go check them out. And, of course, we'll be getting into the previews um, before the first game kicks off. Until then, thanks for watching. And, as always, take care.